طيب بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم والصلاة والسلام على رسول الله وعلى آله وصحبه ومن ولاه أما بعد uh, We'll continue إن شاء الله Our uh, class The Keys to Understanding the Quran A Comprehensive Study of Usul Al-Tafsir uh, The major part today إن شاء الله تعالى We're going to take some principle of Usul Al-Tafsir and uh, continuing from where we have stopped by the emergence of the, the tafsir, and through that we'll see, you know, the, uh, the principle upon which the tafsir was done, you know, uh, in the Salaf, uh, the difference of opinion concerning certain way of tafsir, and the rejected ones that we already have mentioned last time. Uh, just go through this, and you already, I already uploaded uh, this, uh, these notes. However, the major part will be in the Arabic language, uh, so I will be reading and, uh, you know, explaining. You have the text in Arabic, and inshallah, take notes in all what we're going to be studying together. So this text uh, is copied as is from uh, some of the books. And one of the other materials that we're going to be referring to is Fusul Fi Asl Tafsir. Also, I uploaded the book. So if you have any question uh, concerning that or, you know, uh, the most important that we're going to study it, uh, but as reference that I um, have been using, all of them are in the, you know, uh, from the Islamic library in, the, uh, in Arabic. The part that we... Uh, have already studied here, which is the emergence of the sciences of tafsir. Does the Quran need tafsir? We answer this question. And uh, we said, what are the reason causes which led to, uh, to the emergence of the sciences of tafsir? You know, uh, we'll review, inshallah, the notes to, uh, you know, fix some typos and everything. Uh, later. We said the reason one was the sequence of revelations and sequence of the Mas'haf, and the reason two was the Mubham al-Mujmal and specified and general. And those are that we have where we have stopped uh, last time. If you have any question concerning this, so we can continue with the later. The part that I've been referring to in this area is a book came uh, named at Tafsiru wa Rijalu, at Tafsiru wa Rijalu. The tafsir and the people or the scholar or the man of the tafsir. And the uh, author is Muhammad al Fadl ibn Ashur. Muhammad al Fadl ibn Ashur. That's the book that I was referring to in this study. So we said, you know, uh, the reason one was the sequence of the revelation and the sequence of the mushaf. And the reason two, it was the Mubham al Mujmid and specified and general. This is what led to, to the need of the tafsir. However, we said the, the Quran really, uh, in its essence, in the way it was revealed, didn't need any tafsir. And is it clear? And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala qalu wa laqad yassanna al-Qur'an al-dhikri fahal min muddakir. And we mentioned many of the ayat that it really, the message, you know, required for one to understand and to apply to his way of life is there, is very clear, is very clear. And when we have divided the, uh, the tafsir based on the knowledge of people, and uh, we said, you know, if you remember, we can uh, uh, go back in different perspective how we have uh, the types of tafsir. Uh, we said in the regard of people and their knowledge of the Qur'an, so according to Ibn Abbas radiallahu ta'ala an, and he divided it uh, based on the knowledge of the people, how they are relation with the Qur'an. A uh, part known by whose native uh, language is Arabic, and we explain that because it's the, the structure, the way it's been said, the metaphor, the parable, the way of, uh, you know, addressing uh, people in which tone, all of that has its, its, uh, its uh, let's say, its meaning. So, you know, sometimes, as we have mentioned, the example of Dukh innaka anta al-Aziz al-Kareem, taste, indeed, you are the honored, the noble one. Uh, this is actually, it's, it's a way of disgrace when you talk about punishment, saying such a thing 
So the person being addressed to is the person who's already in hellfire. So he's neither honored nor noble. But in the type of the speech that uh, the Arab they use, they understand this is kind of, you know, disgracing and mocking the person, uh, you know. So this is part uh, of the Quran that being understood by those who really use the Arabic language as more that language itself, but as a culture of the language, the culture of the language. So this is part, and this is not part that is, you know, kind of uh, determined in a Quran where the crucial in the Quran in its understanding. No, it's like a style. Uh, the part that no one should not be known in a way that there is no excuse, no one is excused to not know this part of the Quran. And it is what we call, you know, from al ma'lumi min al bil darura Actually, when someone comes to Islam, or he's a Muslim, he's supposed to know that the prayer is one of the pillars of Islam. He's supposed to know that the cat is one of the pillars of Islam. So he cannot someone deny after being a Muslim for years and say, you know, I didn't know that the Salah is a pillar. You say that's actually, it, it's, it's part of the Islam, what you call ma'lumun min ad bil darura. It's the part that need to be known by the fact that someone is Muslim. So the necessities to be known, or like uh, the, 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 uh, the necessity to know these facts about the faith by entering or embracing this faith. faith. The same in the Quran, the same in the Quran. There's part that no one can say that he didn't know or he didn't understand or she didn't understand. Uh, as we mentioned some of the example, you know, uh, there is no God, uh, and we sent not before you any messenger except that we revealed to him that there is no deity except me, so worship me. No one, for example, even for people who do not believe in Islam, come to ask you the question about this. The only question that we had about this area, you know, why they say sometimes me and sometimes we. Uh, for us, it's very, also, this is part of the language. Part of the language, and even in the English language, they have this. They address to a singular person, you know, with the you. And uh, they say people, you know, uh, he's a singular and he says we, or she says we. When it comes to the king or the queen, we said we decided we, uh, you know, ordain. So the we is of the majesty. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in the Quran, when it comes to the oneness of deity, he says me and I. So it will not be any confusion or any, any way for someone to say, you know, it's like we, who are we? So, it, so he, like we sent not before you, so we is Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. But this is from a rububiyah, from the mercy of Allah. So it comes the, the, the talk of the greatness of the majesty we have sent you. You know, kind of showing the gift of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala you. That there is no deity except me. He didn't say except we. So worship me, not so worship we. Because if you say so worship we, the greatness and the majesty here will not fit even by the culture of the language. And even in English language, it will not be correct when you say so worship we. So it's going to be like the question mark to say who are we. But when you say we sent, you're not going to think that there is more than one Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala who sent the messenger. So the first we is the majesty, the greatness of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And then when it comes to Tawheed al-Uluhiyya, the oneness of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, the oneness in the deity, in the worship, in the Ubudiyya, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala uh, use uh, me and I. Uh, and these are, are, there is no confusion in it. It's very clear, very clear. I mean, there is no any ambiguity in it. The third part, uh, this is just to connect of what we've been saying, the third part is known by the scholars, known by so that what seems allegorical and ambiguous. Uh, there's some ambiguity in the understanding, and the ambiguity is coming like to uh, lay down the ahkam, to extract the ahkam, to explain the law of the Sharia that require more effort, more analysis, and those analysis will help to extract more meaning, a greater meaning to help people in their way to help uh, know more knowing the uh, high objective and so on. Uh, so that's the scholar 
who uh, are versed into the knowledge of the Sharia, uh, you know, reflect and, you know, they devote their time. As you see, for example, people, when they devote their time in some, you know, uh, sector or field, they will be more skilled than anybody else in that, in that field, you know. The same here, people who really devote their time in studying the Qur'an, then they bring a lot, extract a lot of meaning, who help the, the community and help the believers in their way to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So this related to, uh, you know, to the scholar. Far known only by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, this Allah reserve uh, to himself the knowledge of these, uh, you know, uh, things that he revealed. But this thing, the absence of knowledge of it by the servant of Allah is actually beneficial for the people. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala give you information, but you will not be able to fully and, uh, you know, comprehend it. Because if we fully comprehend it or being given to us before its time, then it's like, you know, kind of spoiling the whole information. And by giving some certain information, uh, really, uh, you know, kind of conflict with one's objective will also conflict with one's effort, uh, many things. So uh, the example that we have mentioned here, the coming of the hour, the coming of the hour. The coming of the hour, uh, it will not benefit anyone to increase in his action or to do better or to increase, you know, the action of justice required by the human being to establish so the coming of the hour, it's only for Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to know. Is it unseen? And uh, knowing the when the hour is going to happen, it will really change the, the thinking of the people. It change, you know, it's like someone knowing when he's going to die exactly. That it will not have it really change the sense of the life. If someone knows uh, people, they're going to be the whole time depressed because every day they know when they're going to die. And it have like, you know, kind of uh, a timer, you know, they watch, we still have like, you know, a uh, thousand days, you know, what you're going to do. So it's it really, it changed the life of a person. And, you know, some people, they will not even be able to do anything. Other people, they will try, you know, in every day to do more than other day because we're going to die. So it really does not have any uh, benefit to know such a thing, in fact, it will ruin the life of a person if he knows exactly when he's going to die. And even people, when they go to the doctor and they diagnostic say you have only one month to die, even though with that they live a normal life because they say it is in the hand of Allah, some people, they still have that hope that they're going to live more. And yet people, they die even less than a month. Other people, they stay like years after that. So it's all in the hand of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, the same for the hour. So there's, there's certain knowledge, knowing it is actually uh, wrong in, in a way or like, you know, uh, alter and disrupt the life of, uh, of a human being. And those knowledge uh, in general, this type of knowledge that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala reserve uh, the, his will subhanahu wa ta'ala to only know them. Uh, these, when we come back to what we mean studying, then here the reason, so this is why the Qur'an truly does not need tafsir. So someone, for example, say, oh, I cannot study the Qur'an, I cannot read the Qur'an because I need to tafsir and I'm not able to understand the Arabic, I'm not able to find the books, I'm not able to find the right teacher to help me, say, yeah, here, read the Qur'an. Just read it. Read it in the language that you master, the language that you understand. And many people, you know, those who embrace Islam by the will of Allah and by the, uh, you know, the grace of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, they, they read it in their language. They read it in their language. Because the Quran is addressing to the human being and it has the as the first part that we have studied, which is the keys really to understand the Qur'an, just uh, get familiar with the word of the Qur'an, which will give you a true, you know, the vivid, the true, sincere, real vision of your life. And that's really the message of the Qur'an, by knowing who you are, which define for you your objective, and then you define your, for you your purpose of life. 
when we said the two reasons that uh, we have analyzed last time, and uh, you know, uh, briefly, first the sequence of the revelation and the sequence of the Mashab. The sequence, you know, the way how the Quran was revealed, it was revealed in order totally different than the order that we have the Mashab. And we said, the order, uh, it, it like uh, by obligation of the, of the situation of the people, by obligation of circumstances, by obligation to guide the Ummah of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, then the Qur'an had to be revealed in the way that it was revealed. So if the Qur'an was revealed, you know, uh, imagine uh, since the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam was sent, you know, and every time he will have part of the Qur'an. So the first part he will have Surah Al-Baqarah. Imagine the beginning of Surah Al-Baqarah in Mecca. It's not gonna, it's going to, not gonna have an effect. So it's, it's a message that it's not in coherence of the situation of the Prophet, nor of the people who are around. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala was talking about munafiqeen in the first message to the Prophet. When the Prophet sallallahu didn't yet establish a state in which people, they will be scared to say that we are kuffar. So what is nifaq? It's to hide their kuffar. Why? Because there's a sovereignty of Islam, you know, and there's a chief who are leading the whole society and the whole, uh, you know, uh, uh, community, he was the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. So it does not make, it does not uh, have its effect and it's not relevant. Iqra, it was the perfect, you know, message to start with the journey to Allah Subhanahu Wa Ta'ala. But Iqra, when you see it, you see the Mus'haf, you'll find it in the end of the Mus'haf. So the Qur'an was then put in order based on a generation to come to have a structure meaning starting by someone learning how to convey the message. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala said, this book has guidance in it. He said, alhamdulillah. Then he will tell you the first group who are the believer, those are the successful. The other opposite of the believer are people who disbelieve, who have seal in their hearts, and they will not even comprehend the message. سَوَاءٌ عَلَيْهِمْ أَنْذَرْتَهُمْ أَمْ لَنْ تُنْذِرْهُمْ لَا يُؤْمِنُونَ And then the third group who has disease in their hearts. So the, 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 the subhanAllah, the first message you hear is like there's disease in the heart, the one who going to be purifying his heart, he's going to join the first group. The one who going to have his heart being, subhanAllah, uh, topping, you know, layers over layers of darkness, till he die, he's going to join the second group. The one who is not caring, he's going to be in the third group, munafiqeen. And he's going to be going up and down. So this is... A message that you enter, it gives you definition. Then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala tell you, okay, this is the story of the first, your father. And this is the, his story, how he's being, you know, deluded by someone that he's present with you today. Seeking to mislead you as he did for your father. However, as I did for your father, I gave him the tool to protect himself, which are the Sharia. Eat from everything and do not eat from the, this uh, tree. This is the whole Sharia. Do what Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala allow you to do and command you to do and be away from what Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala prohibited. For Adam it has two ahka. However, to lean or for someone to, to be, subhanAllah, tempted by the prohibition, it's there is something in the nafs. It's about psychology, it's about heart, about uh, curiosity, about, you know, longing for things. So what tempted Adam, we have it. The same. So it's either Adam had 
a hundred law to follow or one law is going to be the same because the temptation, what happened, this complexity of the nafs is the same. Then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala said, now you know your enemy who is Iblis and whoever follow him. You know how go to go to back to Allah if you make mistake? Yes, repentance. So you have everything you need for your life. That's in the beginning of the book. Then let's go in more details. Here, people before you, he's been conveyed this gift. Look what they did. They only gained the curse and the wrath of Allah because of their action, because of turning away the gift. So open your eyes. This is an experience that you should not repeat. This is Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala presenting you what you need to protect yourself and be watchful. Now you understand this, then enter completely to Islam. Let's start with the Siyam. Let's start then with the Hajj. Let's start with the Jihad. And then after Jihad, let's complete the society by sharing in the end of Surah Al-Baqarah is a Sadaqah wa Zakat. And after that, he said, and remember, you're going back to Allah. And that was the last ayah in the Quran. And then it goes in more details. This is how the people of the book, they did. Ali Imran and more in Ghazwat Uhud, the Munafiqeen, how they acted. And all of it, you see the hand of Allah cherishing, guiding, helping the believer. So you see the divine laws in every part of this surah. And then comes Surah Al-Nisa and Surah Al-Ma'idah. And then it brings you back to build your aqidah after all this knowledge in Surah Al-An'am. And then it gives you like, subhanAllah, part of the family of your ancestors who are the believers in Surah Al-A'raf. Again, talking to you about Adam. And then Nuh. And then Hud. And then Salah. And then Shu'ayb, Walut. And then he give you the story of Musa, the closest to us, which is like the most complete story that had the same aspect that we are facing in society, in every society. That's Surah Al-A'raf. And then comes the Anfal, what Tawbah, and so on. So it's compact, complete system of life, system of guidance, teaching that it needs to start in this way. Now, the scholar, when they come, for example, in Surah Al-Anfal, they read, they say, this is, is related to Ghazwat Badr. Let's see. When Ghazwat Badr happened, so you find it happened, you know, after 14 years from the prophethood or more. So we're going to study the society at that time. We're going to study uh, the mood, uh, the new culture introduced with Islam, being in one community, they have a masjid. Not like in Mecca, they didn't have a place just to meet in the Al-Arqam, Dar Al-Arqam, Ibn Abi Al-Arqam. So there is totally different perspective of thinking. There is, there is a code, there is a, you know, a constitution that they refer to. So this is all help to understand the surah from different perspective than you read it without putting those ayat in the context that they were revealed in. And this is the first reason of needing the tafsir. So it's like you want the Quran to be not something uh, stripped from the life of the ayat. The Quran is filled with life. So the context, uh, you know, when Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala speaks to the believers, or you hear, for example, ayat, you try to imagine the way how it was sent is like someone you call someone for example say yeah amr someone is named amr for example he say yeah amr and then some another way say yeah amr and say yeah amr these the same sentence totally different context right the first one, you hear from the voice, yeah, Amr. It's like there's a friendship, there's care, 
listen to me. I want to talk to you, you know, kind of see missing you. <laughs> the second one is different. The third one is like you're starting a fight. It's the same sentence. So when you read the Quran, the reason of revelation, it does not define to you the meaning of the ayah. It defines to you the context, how you should approach the ayah. It's like, you know, uh, the way it's admonition, it's something like, you know, coming with severe, you know, uh, uh, speech. Is it a kind of speech? And so on. So it gives, for example, this context helps you to understand is this then an obligation? Is this haram? Or it is makruh? Or it is mustahab? And so on. So just I'm giving you just idea to, to comprehend the differences that the, the, for which we are needing to go back and look to our self and look to this reason of revelation to understand the context. That's why many people, when, when they, for example, the scholar is saying, you take one hadith and you build the hukum on it, that's haram in a new way. Because you make an ishtihad without having the qualities nor the credential of the ishtihad. Because if someone say, tell you, oh, this is, look, hadith, just bring me another hadith who say otherwise. I said the problem is that you already been determined on the hukum or the ruling concerning this matter from this only hadith. I said, yeah, he, there's a scholar, they said, he said, yeah, he, are you comparing the hadith of the Prophet Sallallahu with the scholar saying, does not work because the hadith of the Prophet Sallallahu is above it. Of course. But however the scholars, they understand after analysis the context in which the hadith was said. There is a meaning, there is a illa, there is, there is a subhanAllah reasons behind building this hukum. That's why the, there is a difference between Ahlul Athar and Ahlul Ra'i and the group between them. So, for example, if you take the hukum from the words of the hadith, it might not really fulfill the objective of the hukum. Why? Because the hadith, it might imply something else. That's why you need to see, you know, many events or scenes, uh, the same scenes of the same, uh, uh, you know, uh, issue or mas'ala, from the life of the Prophet, from the companion, to analyze and have a conclusion for that mas'ala. That's why, man, you find the difference of opinion between, between the scholar because of trying to understanding the context and put it within, uh, you know, its perspective. And this perspective will be put uh, in the line of the high objective. That's how the hukum is extracted. And that's why people want to say, you know, uh, then we say, you do not have really the right to look at hadith or one ayah. And he said, you know, that's the, uh, the, the hukum. I'll show you, for example, ayah here. And tell me how this ayah was used in a way to truly, you know, uh, To really changing uh, the, the message of the Quran. It's very clear this ayah. It's very clear. Many of the ayat, which actually there's people, they find difficulties sometimes uh, with this ayat because there is one principle that inshallah will have it in our conclusion, which is very important, inshallah will add it. Uh, which is, there is allegorical thing, allegorical thing which are like mutashab, things like you're not sure of the uh, direct message. And there are things that are well established, muhkama. 
Therefore, this is the principle. Anything mutashabah, pour it under one category of al-muhkam. For example, this A. Look. One A. Ya ayyuhalladhina amanu, or you believe, qatilu, fight those who close to you from the disbeliever. And let them find in you uh, harshness. And know that Allah is we with the, those who fear uh, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Fight those adjacent to you of the disbeliever and let them find in you harshness. How do you explain this ayah? Literally, if you want to someone read this ayah, and want to implement it. Who is the disbeliever? Exactly. So someone saying you like you're not a believer. You say what? They said you live in among all this neighborhood of disbelief. You didn't do anything. You are disobeying Allah. Why you didn't fight them? See them every day and you don't say anything. And you are making awliya of al-kuffar by saying them good morning every day. <laughs> How will we explain this ayah? So you see, now the tafsir is required. So if someone, for example, from those people, like, you know, groups, of a takfir and those like, you know, that they were uh, every day in the news and they disappeared because their agenda, they used it for an agenda that uh, it's not, uh, uh, you know, up to date anymore. Like those ISIS. So reading this ayah, they said, look, the Quran did. And uh, a few years ago, there is someone which is really, uh, this is uh, also, uh, let's say, who contributed in spreading or like the Islamophobist. They used it to really uh, increase and uh, have more partisans. Uh, this person who used to give uh, seminars, seminars. Uh, actually, I think he's originally Palestinian. But uh, not good one at all. And I don't think, uh, I'm not sure if he still was Muslim or not. But he claimed that he had, you know, a problem and uh, been imprisoned by the, um, you know, the Israeli government, etc. But he became like someone who gives seminars about Islam. And he was very famous that uh, all the, you know, police department in different states, they invite him. And all what his, you know, theme, why he was become famous and, I, 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 you know, it, it came across some people that sent me his reference and some of uh, what he's been doing and some, you know, uh, press release on this person. Or he thinks that Islam is violence. So he using ayat like this, an ayah which is in uh, Surah uh, here in Surah Muhammad. Actually, this one I heard in short uh, clip uh, of YouTube. He was using this. Here. So when you meet those who disbelieve, uh, of course, in battle here is the translation. In the Quran, there is no battle. He said, so when you meet those who disbelieve, strike their necks until when you have inflicting slaughter upon them. So he been saying, he said, look, this is their Quran. You know, uh, strike their necks. And those, you know, you see, you know, people, you know, from uh, authorities and people 
who's work in the, the government, they're like amazed. They said, this is Islam, they tell us peace and everything. And this guy saying, I am Muslim, my background this, I lived in this land, and this is from where they take their violence. So this is two ayah that I have mentioned to you. Of course, the battle here is being added as the Quran itself, that's one of the principles of the tafsir that is meant already because the context, it is a battle. If you read the ayat before it, so if you take ayah and you wanted to explain it, it's going to be given a horrible explanation. Something that is not the word of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Coming back to the other ayah, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, this is in Surah Al-Tawbah. In Surah Al-Tawbah, the explanation of this ayah, you go back to the first ayah. This is a declaration of dissociation from Allah and His Messenger to those with whom you had made a treaty among the disbelievers, mushrikeen. You have four months to go out of the haram, to do this, to do this. And it is announcement from Allah and his messenger to the people on the day of the greater pilgrimage that Allah he dissociated from this believer. And so he is his messenger. So if you repent, it's best for you. But if you turn away, then know that you will not cause failure to Allah. Except those that you have a treaty with them. When the sacred month have passed, then open because they already been given the warning. They are already in battle. So it goes the whole surah and he said, continue to do, to fulfill, establish back the peace in, in the society. Because these people, they've been transgressing you, they've been killing you, they've been doing this, doing this, doing this, for more than 30, 23 years. So this is the tafsir that we need. Look, this ayah is number five. The ayah that I have mentioned to you is in the end of the surah. Number 124. So if you take the surah out, this ayah, he number 123, out of his context, out of the surah, out of understanding what happened, how the Prophet Sallallahu sent Abu Bakr, Abi Bakr, and sent Ali, and Ali radiallahu ta'ala going in Mina saying there is no mushrik will be here. This is, this is an announcement for you. This is an announcement to come to, to peace. And this is Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala said, when إِذَا جَاءَ نَصْرُ اللَّهِ وَالْفَتْحُ وَرَأَيْتَ النَّاسَ يَدْخُلُونَ فِي دِينِ اللَّهِ أَفْوَجِ That's happening in this same after this year. So when you know the, the, the history, the seerah, what happening, what was going on, what was the culture of war that they have, how they, subhanAllah, they have that, uh, you know, always uh, thinking of retaliation, of thar. You understand the context. But you come and you read this ayah today, is exactly as Brother Abdul said. Everyone has to get the sword, you know, to be according to the sunnah, <laughs> not a uh, gun. According to the sunnah, a sword, a spear, and bow, when you go to the neighborhood, start by the dogs, because the dogs are <laughs> they say. You see how uh, it, it's not, that's where required the tafsir. And this is the difference between uh, the Qur'an, the sequence of the Qur'an based on the revelation and the sequence of the Qur'an based on the mushaf, the message that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala sent to the whole humankind. Therefore, going back to that sequence is required to know the context, to understand, you know, uh, many variables into the society to help us understand. It's not, for example, addressing a society in persecution, people being persecuted, 
and totally different to address to people in a community together, united, totally different. So the people, uh, the language and the way that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala was addressing to the Prophet and the believer in Medina was totally different than it was addressed in Mecca. That's why we have Quran, we call it Mecca and Madani. The Mecca short surah, short ayah. The Madani is giving you, you know, constitution, organization, building society, etc., etc. Totally different. Therefore, today, if you want to organize and help our community and everything, say which type of Quran or like what part of the Quran should we focus on? I mean, we have difficulties. Everyone is focusing on what the Prophet ﷺ did in the end of the year of his message. When our society is far, maybe, you know, not comparable to the first year of what the believer had as Iman with the Prophet in the first year of the prophethood. So we have to elevate the Ummah to the level of uh, behavior and conduct that the believer they had in Hajjat al wadah so we can implement the Ahkam. And people they come impose on you a lot of Ahkam when people they not even able to just pray their prayers. This is part of the tafsir. That's why the scholar they have what they call al-isqatul amthal. Al-isqatul amthal, you want to bring the ayat and the hadith and you want to apply them on, on reality. So they say you have to study first the reality to see which part relevant for this reality from the Quran and the Sunnah to help these people. Uh, someone addicted to alcohol, which is a very famous example that all of you, you know. You're going to try to bring him an ayah in the Quran that it does not apply on any believer except for this person. Why? Because you want to help him. When someone, you see him falling and subhanAllah, far from Allah, you want him to bring him back to Allah or you want to judge him and put him already in hellfire. In many ahadith, the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, when someone came, uh, came to him in, in a very, uh, you know, uh, ill manners, uh, coming and holding the Prophet, strangling him, and people, you know, uh, the companion around the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, they love him so much, they don't want anybody to touch him. When everyone is like crashing to this man, he said, keep, no, 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 leave him, leave him alone, leave him to me. And then he talked to him nicely. That person, he's living, loving the Prophet, smiling, saying salam to everyone. And then here comes the reminder. He said, don't you see? Did you see that? If I let you doing such a thing, you might have killed him. And then what happened to this person? In that situation, he's going to be in the wrath of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Because he ended his life or his life was ended in a state of ungratefulness. Now look how he, he lived. So if you are really color for the, uh, you know, to convey the beauty of this deen, think to invite, not to judge and put everyone in hellfire. Or yeah? so the ayah that I have mentioned is in Surah An-Nisa. I mean, uh, let's read it back because this is uh, our tafsir, a class of the uh, keys of the tafsir. Let's see if I... Astaghfirullah. 
and uh, let's see. The way that is written, confused here. Uh, at the end of uh, yeah, here, here. I read this. All you have believed, do not approach prayer while you are intoxicated. Until you know what you are saying. Intoxicated, drunk. Huh? Tell me now drinking alcohol is halal. Say, how can you say? He said, Allah said it. Huh? In ayah 4, 4, uh, ayah 13, he said, ayah 43. He said, don't come. So it's okay to drink, but don't be drunk when you come to pray. If he's drinking is halal, then the hashish is halal, the drug is halal, everything, intoxicant. <laughs> so this area is only valid for the believer who want to save a brother or sister or someone that they want to save them. Say, so, hey, you know, it's how can you want me to pray? I'm far from the dean of things. Uh, you know, say, what's your problem? To tell you the truth, you know, I do drink. And he says, that's fine. What's the problem? You drink, no problem. You're already drinking. Can you stop, come, just connect with Allah and for you to know what to say to Allah, try to not be drunk at that time. He's gonna tell you, really? He said, yeah. Allah wants you to come to him. So someone else take, you know, harsh and extreme said, how can you do such a thing? Are you making the, the, the alcohol haram? He said, no, who said? But this is the stages to help this person come to Allah. Help him to have, subhanAllah, hoping the mercy of Allah. Don't put obstacle to this person. Help him. And who's teaching us this is Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Because there's many ayat abrogated. Surah Al-Ahzab was as long as Surah Al-Baqarah. All of it was abrogated because there's ahkam, it does not, it served its purpose in the time of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam to educate the Ummah to think. And Allah knows that there will not be, there is the hukum state in the Sunnah, but will not be fitting in his knowledge subhanahu wa ta'ala in the Quran. There is ayat that explain it and more. At that time, the Ummah was not in its maturity to, to understand it or to apply it. But he left this A. He left it not to tell you that he's okay, but to help you to understand how, subhanAllah, to invite people and to be someone with, filled with kindness and mercy. So this is from the tafsir, from the ishtihad in the tafsir to explain, said, this is, so we have this one here, and in Surah Al-Ma'idah, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala said, it's haram. Of course it's haram, because it is haram. But this one stayed here, we recite it in the Quran because of a purpose. And the purpose is one of the purpose that the one that we have mentioned. There's many ayat uh, that, uh, you know, fit into this category which require this analysis, which require this tafsir. So you see, many things that, uh, you know, requires and led to the emergence of the book of tafsir. 
The second one that we have mentioned, uh, as I said, is the mubham uh, al-mujmal. Al-mubham al-mujmal is things like, you know, as I have mentioned, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala say, establish prayer. So the prayer is the connection to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. What prayer I'm going to do? How I'm going to do? I'm going to be on my knees. Yes. No, it's not in the Quran. No, it's not. Allah took them. And even, you know, big part of it, the Prophet ﷺ, uh, had made to forget them. We know a fact, and but we have somewhat the companion. They mention a few ayat, few ayat like as a meaning, and those meaning being still remembered because uh, you know the hukum, the ruling of it still, you know, applied up to today. So I said, what is the evidence of this? You say the evidence is the hadith of the prophet, the action of the prophet. In, in fact, was part of the Quran been being abrogated. So there is a few things that we know that it was in the Quran, but it has been abrogated by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. However, the hukum, so we have the abrogation and nasikh wal mansukh in three categories. The first category, that ayat abrogated hukman wa tilaw. Its recitation is abrogated and the regulation or the ruling relate to it is also abrogated. There is ayat who has been abrogated tilawatan and its hukum is still applied. So it's not is in Quran, but its ruling is still valid and applied. There is ayat that been the hukum of it is abrogated, but is still in the Quran recited, like this ayat that we have mentioned. So these are the three types of al-nasikh wal mansukh And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala mentioned in two ayah, one ayah in Surah Al-Baqarah, قَالَ مَا نَنْسَخْ مِنْ آيَةٍ أَوْ نُنْسِيَ أَنَا أَتِي بِخَيْرٍ مِنْهَا أَوْ مِثْلِهَا إِنَّ اللَّهُ عَلَى كُلِّ شَيْءٍ قَدِيرٍ When they said, look, Muhammad, he's taken and, uh, you know, changing the Qur'an. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala said, whatever we, uh, you know, uh, establish or confirm or we abrogate is by the knowledge of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Whatever we take will reveal one better, like it or better. And better, all is the word of Allah, but better into helping the society fulfilling its objective. So, um, just a curiosity question. So, what other time of the Prophet, how would they, how would they consider, like, for example, the Hatma of the Quran, right? So now, so the biggest moment is there, you know, somebody is talking to him. How they... they followed the recitation of the Prophet and they have the writer of the Quran. So the, the Quran is memorized. When it comes to the sequence of the Quran, based on what the Prophet recites in the Quran, in the Salah, and what he tells them. Because when an ayah, for example, a group of ayat are revealed, he will call those known. Uh, the writer of the Quran said, put this ayat after the ayah so-and-so in Al-Baqarah, for example. So you'll have, for example, Al-Baqarah was completed, uh, you know, uh, only completed after nine years. So you have, for example, the beginning of the Baqarah, small part in the middle, part toward the end. So the companion, you know, close to the Prophet Sallallahu they know this is Surah Al-Baqarah. So when they start and they end to this ayah, they go to the next ayah that they already have from Surah Al-Baqarah, and so on. And then when the other block comes, it's going to repeat. So when they come to it, they recite that, and then the other one, and so on. And the one that is being abrogated is being taken away from the Quran. So they don't recite it anymore. No, the, the majority of it by the Prophet. 
The surah itself is from Allah. The sequence of the ayat, the majority, not the ayat of the surahs, the majority by the Prophet No, so the ayat within the surah, that's from the Prophet. Okay. The surahs orders the majority of it by the Prophet. The rest was fully completed after the first compilation of the Quran. So we have the unanimous and the consensus of the companion on the order of that what happened, but it happened by ishtihad. Because how the ishtihad? We have hadith of the Prophet ﷺ that he read Al-Baqarah, then Al-Nisa, then Ali Imran. So for example, in Mas'haf Ibn Mas'ud, he had this sequence. In another Mas'haf that the Prophet ﷺ said, read Al-Baqarah, Al-Nisa, Ali Imran and Al-Nisa. So the differences of the ayat, it was very minor. However, when the companion, they come together and they made the first mushaf with the committee of the writer of the Quran and the scholar of the Quran, you know, that Zayd ibn Thabit or Ubay ibn Ka'b, you know. In time of Abi Bakr and Umar, and Umar was supervising the whole thing, then the mushaf was put based on the order in the most of the ishtihad, so for example, say, let's all have agree according to what we heard from the Prophet and everything. So this is the most closest of what we know. And they put it together. So the must-have that we have, the sequence of the ayat as exactly as Allah revealed it. The sequence of the surah as the majority by the Prophet and been fully, let's say, completed and agreed upon by all the companions. And therefore, as the, it becomes an ijma', no one can change it afterward because we have the consensus of the first generation on that book, on the order of the surah. It was a very minor, you know, and even the difference of opinion in some of the surah it was like not more than two or three opinions. So it's like like few surahs. Like for example, between Al-Anfal and Tawbah are the one surah uh, and split in two, you know. Or Tawbah is one surah on its own without Bismillah. This small thing that they had. Any other question? No, the, it was called the Rasm al-Uthmani because it's done in his time. Rasm al-Uthmani has a, a wisdom in it. The first compilation happened in time of Abi Bakr, supervised by Umar with the committee of the Qurra from, the, uh, from uh, Mecca, Quraysh, and from the Ansar. And the leader... In, in supervising the wording, uh, all they were from the Quraysh because the majority of the Quran was revealed in the language of the, uh, in the tongue of the Prophet Sallallahu which was Quraysh. Uh, when Abu Bakr passed away, Omar kept the book, you know, just, you know, to preserve the book because uh, the idea came from Omar when more than 70 of the uh, scholar of the Qira'at they was killed in the battle of Yemen with the Murtadin and the followers of the false prophet, uh, you know, Musaylim al kadhab Umar kept it. Then Hafsa, radiallahu ta'ala anha, Umm al-Mu'mineen. When uh, Hudayf ibn al-Yaman came from many of the cities that he visited when Islam was spreading all over the world, he came to Uthman with, with a very, you know, uh, big issue. So he's like, you know, uh, kind of begging and talking with a very high concern that the Quran is going to be lost. Why? Because people with, uh, you know, different uh, tongue, they are uh, kind of uh, changing the meaning of uh, the Quran by their tongue which is like is going to change the, the whole meaning of the Qur'an. So Uthman radiallahu ta'ala an then 
he want to compile the Quran, but this time with, uh, with another objective. The objective is to confirm that has been compiled with the another committee, so to have the certainty in the heart of everyone who come after that it's been done twice with the very, uh, you know, uh, high committee and with high accuracy and precision and with every area they're going to be put to written by bringing two witnesses that they saw the one who wrote it is, is writing it in front of the prophet and so on. Very, you know, strict condition. The other objective is to have one mushaf because every, some of the companion scholar, we call them scholar because they were like more versed toward the Quran, other toward the fiqh, like Mu'adh ibn Jabal, you know, and so on. They have their own mushaf, their personal one. They wrote it, so it's very dear to them. In the mushaf, he might have language that he wrote and reported from the Prophet, not like, for example, the other mushaf that another companion has. So this is Abdullah ibn Mas'ud, he knows the difference and he knows what Abu Musa al-Ash'ari, for example, has. So he knows the differences. And he knows why it's different. After three, four generations, no one knows the reason of the differences. And then he might say, this mushaf is wrong. And then you're going to create a big fitna. So the objective of Uthman is to unite the whole ummah on one single mushaf. What they're going to do with all the other masahif is by subhanallah an order of the uh, government is to burn them all. That's why Ibn Mas'ud had something in his heart that they took away by force his masahif and they burned it. But for the sake of the ummah, I mean, I think it's Ibn Mas'ud, I need to check back. But one of the companions have and burn all the masahif, you know, and have the masahif al um the mother. The Mas'af al-Um was a reading in a way to include the most possible of the differences of style of Qira'at. So it was written without that. And was written in a way to show in the word, for example, the root of the word. For example, Zakat, you see it written with Wow. Because the root of it is zakawa, increase. Salat, you know, you know. And there's tam of tuha, tam arbuta. So it was, and for example, with no dots. So all the qira'at that accepted today, one of his conditions that it can be conformed with the mushaf of Uthman. For example, qala wandur ila al-idami kayfa nunshizuha. In another qira'a nunshiruha. When you see the root of the word is the same. The dots, when you change them, you change the word. But these words are complementing each other in understanding the ayah. However, there is some masahaf who has another word. That word will not, if she's not in masahaf Uthman, so that qira'a we do not accept it. Even though in origin we know that is sahih. So to preserve the Qur'an. So that's when we say Rasm Uthman is the Rasm that it becomes the reference to the Qira'a Sahiha that is a worship when we recite it and that what we recite in the Salah. That's why we say it Mas'af Uthman. So Uthman radiallahu ta'ala made five copies of it or some narration says seven and he sent it to the all the main center of the Muslim world and every book was taken by, by one of the greatest scholar Qurra at that time. It was his mission, you know, from Uthman to do it. So he'll take the mushaf and he go and he teach the Quran. So all the qira'at, for example, Nafa' wa Asim wa Zayyat wa Amr, all of them, they learned from the scholars who brought the copy of the mushaf in their town, for example, in Mecca, or the one who stayed in Medina, and in Al-Basra, and in Kufa, and so on, and in Yemen. Well, Allah <laughs> yahfaz. 
And then when the Qira'at was, uh, you know, kind of defined, that one they add the dots. So the dots was added in the time of Marwan ibn Abdul Malik, in his time, the dots. Because without dots, the one who does not know the Qur'an, he will not be able to read the Qur'an. And then in our time, they add the shekel, because the farther you go, the weaker will be the tongue in the Arabic, you know. So they add the, the shekel, the shekel which is the vials that we see. Yeah. He was one of the writers of the Wahy. Yeah, he was one of the writers, radiallahu ta'ala. Taib. Any other question? So those are the main reasons. Um, we have mentioned to you the most, the 10 uh, advanced companion, Ridwan Allah Ta'ala Alayhim, in the uh, tafsir of the Quran. Uh, I will mention them again. They are first the four Khalifa, Abu Bakr, wa Umar, wa Uthman, wa Ali, Radiallahu Ta'ala Anhum. Then Abdullah ibn Mas'ud, wa Zubayr ibn al Awam, wa Zayd ibn Thabit. وأبي ابن كعب وأبو موسى الأشعري وعبد الله ابن عباس So these are ten The ten the more uh, the most knowledgeable of the book of Allah سبحانه وتعالى in the tafsir However as the first nine they died early which make the tenth one to be the most famous in the tafsir who is Ibn Abbas. So Ibn Abbas was the youngest, but was the elder of the Tabi'een. So he was the chain connecting the knowledge of the Sahaba, the Prophet وسلم, the companion, what they said about the Quran, and with the generation who came to learn those who didn't see Abu Bakr, didn't see Umar, didn't see the great of the companion. That's why in all the Quran say most of the Khotafasi say Ibn Abbas, Ibn Abbas. Why Ibn Abbas? Because he was the teacher of the new generation. So he was the most famous and he was the Hibr al-Ummah radiallahu ta'ala. Uh, Ibn Abbas, uh, may Allah be pleased with him and his enrichment of the tafsir. So what Ibn Abbas add, added to the tafsir? قال اتصل تفسير القرآن عند Ibn Abbas بعناصر زائدة. So Ibn Abbas, he add new things to enrich the, the library or the analysis or the, uh, you know, the science of the Quran. Beside what we have mentioned from the reason one and reason two, and the reason two, it's, it's uh, I think we already talked about it, uh, is to specify, to clarify what was mentioned in a general way. For example, al uh, mawarith the inheritance. Allah give us the main ones. But then, as you know, when it comes to uh, certain cases, it require analysis. That's where the clarification is in the sun. The salat, establish a prayer. How I'm going to pray? The Prophet says, say, pray as you see me praying. And so on. So, al-mujmalu, what is al-mujmal is being, should be clarified. It's either by Quran. If it's not the Quran, we go to the sunnah. If we're not in the sunnah, we go to the sea in the saying of the companion and so on. What Ibn Abbas radiallahu ta'ala an add, you know, along these two uh, aspects that we have mentioned, uh, mainly the ahadith, I mean, these two aspects include the reason of re revelation, the al-mubhamu uh, fil Qur'an. He used to add a linguistic aspect. Ibn Abbas, he the first who added a linguistic aspect to understanding the Qur'an. 
For example, he used to understand, you know, uh, introduce the wisdom in this particular structure. For example, say, why say iyaka na'budu, not say na'budu iyaka? So the structure of the sentence, it has a depth in it. Uh, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala said, Alhamdulillahi fatir samawati wal ard. Originator. He didn't say, uh, Alhamdulillah, Khaliq is the creator. Ibn Abbas, he said, I have two uh, from, originally from Yemen. They came to dispute. They have, you know, a, a dispute and they reported to me to be their arbitrator. The issue was about the well. So everyone claimed that the well belongs to him. So one of them, he said, أنا فاطر هذا البئر. فاطر هذا البئر. So Ibn Abbas, فاطر, is a language that he's not, he does not know. So it's a language used in that part of the region which is in Yemen. He said, it helped me to understand فاطر السماوات your ours. So he said, I originated, so it didn't exist. So there is difference between creating mold, fashion, put, or to make something out of non-existence. So it requires a design before even to originate it. Because when someone said, I created something, he said, based on image, based on prototype, based on idea that you have said, no, fatiri, it means that being created from a non-existence and it didn't exist any prototype from it or any ideas about it. So it, it gave more depth is understanding of the creation of Allah. So this is the uh, enrichment of the tafsir that added by Ibn Abbas in radiallahu ta'ala an, in the understanding the depth of the words in the Arabic language, its structure. And he had as a repertoire, repertoire as a reference, to go to is al-shi'r al-jahili. They call a shi'r al-jahili in the poems that been, you know, recited and developed and said in the time of jahiliyyah, the ignorance before the prophethood. So why Ibn Abbas has it as a repertoire to, to, uh, to explain the book of Allah, to explain all this depth, all this, uh, you know, subtle thing in the language, because he said Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala qala inna anzalnahu qur'anan arabiyan. We have sent it down in Arabic Qur'an. Who then, let's go to the Arabs how they used to do this, use these words in their language would help us to understand. So many of the mufassirin, he said, this ayah, it means this, and this word has this meaning, even though in the ayah, you know, in the word, it does not look like it. However, we have, before the coming of the Prophet, it been used in this context. So they borrow the understanding of that particular word in a context that being said in this type of poems to understand what Allah wants us to understand in this particular ayah. And this is was the added by Ibn Abbas in radiallahu ta'ala anhu. فَكَانَ كَثِيرًا مَا يَقُولُ عِنْدَمَا يُسْأَلْ عَنْ مَعْنَ مِنْ تَرَكِيبِ الْقُرْآنِ فَيُقَرِّرُهُ He used to, many times when he was asked on some of the structure of the sentences to, you know, uh, asking for its meaning, he will give them the explanation and he tell them, you didn't hear the poet so and so when he said this and this and this. They said, oh yeah, you're right. So he gave them as an evidence that it being said and used it in this context. Then he said, yes. So that's an evidence to what he, his explanation that he presented, radiallahu uh, ta'ala. Al-Tabariyu, after that, he the one who who used this technique, if you can say, or this style too, to also uh, uh, understand or uh, explain the Qur'an. 
وكثيرا ما كان يفسر الكلمات ببيان أنها معربة عن لغة أخرى Also some of the words in the Quran being used and its origin is not Arabic and this is uh, some of the people who uh, you know uh, trying to uh, uh, to find uh, you know discrepancies and uh, issues in the Quran they say how come we say the Quran was revealed in the Arabic language when there's words who originally are not Arabic and actually Ibn Abbas he used to explain some of the words that they are in the Quran by referring to the origin language from which they came. But for people who are claiming that these are not Arabic, the answer they are Arabic. How? He said the word Arabic is not the word that originated from its beginning Arabic. And we say actually how it could be originated Arabic. So it's a way of communication. So if any word from any language used to communicate in people speaking Arabic and understand each other, that word becomes an Arabic. Because they don't use the word in a context or in a structure of sentence the way it's used from its original language. For example, if you use English, and uh, you use a sentence in it, an adjective, and you take the same adjective and you want to use it in the Arabic, you're not going to use the same structure of the language. Maybe you're going to put the adjective, you know, after the noun. In the Arabic, you put the adjective before. So you borrow the word. It sounds like Arabic, but you apply on it the structure and the, uh, of the Arabic language becomes an Arabic. As Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala khala walladhina yad'una min duni ma yamlikuna min qatmir. Qatmir, they don't, uh, you know, those who are calling uh, besides Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, they do not own any anything, you know, any speck of any dust, if you can say it. So qatmir, it's not Arabic language. But it's been used to specify something very small. So when you read it here, you cannot say, oh, this is not Arabic. So it is Arabic because it's applied the whole language and the people who are addressed to are Arab, they understand it. So it's like they want to create issues in the Quran where they do not, uh, you know, exist. Ibrahim is not an Arabic uh, word. That's why some of Qira'at, you say Ibrahim, Ibrahim, uh, Mikail, Mikaila in some of the Qira'at. Jibra'il, Jabra'ila. So when you say Jabra'ila and Jibreel, we know who is Jibreel. But don't come take it as an evidence to tell me, oh, you said it's Arabic Quran and there's words who are not Arabic. So it does not make a sense. Huh? قال وقد وردت أقوال كثيرة عنه في ذلك في صحيح البخاري. If you go to the book of Tafsir in Sahih al-Bukhari, you'll find many of these sayings that I have mentioned that al-Bukhari mentioned in his book. Another aspect that been introduced by Ibn Abbas رضي الله تعالى عنه is the aspect of al-akhbar. Al-akhbar are the news and the uh, situation or the events of people or nations or generation that happened before. Uh, the Prophet وسلم, didn't mention uh, يرجع إلى بيان مبهمات القرآن وذلك ما كان يرجع فيه إلى مصادر المعرفة المتوفرة لديهم. So he used to refer to uh, you know reference to to what they know at the time from history. It might be from the people of the book, it might be from historian. So knowing that and verifying it, he will also introduce it. For example, talking about the nation of Ad. The nation of Ad, he might refer 
to what some of the Arab historians talking about these nations. He said they have this, they have their, you know, for example, Mada and Salah, you know, their, their uh, castle, they used to build it. So he introduced facts who helped to give more vivid image to the story related in the Quran. So he's, radiallahu uh, ta'ala anhu, also he introduced that. Uh, he also referring to some of the story that being mentioned also in the people, in the books of the people of the book, uh, Al-Yahud wa Nasar. These are the main two aspects that uh, Ibn Abbas radiallahu ta'ala an introduced uh, after the, with the, the Sahaba to, to, the, to the science of the tafsir. <coughs> And all of these four aspects, they call it a tafsiru bil ma'thur. A tafsiru bil ma'thur. All these four aspects, call it a tafsiru bil ma'thur. So al ma'thur referring back to the saying of the Prophet, of the companion, and the tabi'een after them by referring to saying that being said in the first two generations or three generations, with the Senate, with the Senate. So with Senate, we have a chain of narration, uh, you know, generation after generation been reporting these tafsir, that's what we call a tafsiru bil ma'thur. A tafsiru bil ma'thur, it's not the only tafsir. However, look the balance. The true mufassir, the one who want to understand the Quran, he will not neglect or ignore the tafsir bil ma'thur. And he tried to understand the Quran according to his understanding, or according to his knowledge. That's a deviation in the deen. Why? Because you cannot turn away or be in ghina, I mean, uh, not in use or in need of the context, of the reason of revelation to give you a sense of the meaning of the ayat. However, also the tafsir of al ma'thur should not be the end of the tafsir. Every time the Quran speaks to you, therefore you need to express the way of the Quran according to the language of your time. But the language of your time to help understand better the way of Allah in the time we live in by having the reference, the tafsir of al-ma'thur. So we will not go beyond the tafsir of al-ma'thur and not stop exploring and understanding the Quran at the boundaries of the tafsir of al-ma'thur. This is what brings us to the next topic which is a tafsir bil ra'i ruling of the tafsir bil ra'i ruling uh, uh, related to the tafsir bil ra'i can someone make tafsir by his own understanding say wallahi i read something is amazing uh, the quran and this and this he said how can you say such a thing i mean what knowledge do you have to say about the quran so he said it's possible to do such a thing the scholar who came after the tabi'in and writing and the contemporary scholar they were writing do they have the right to write tafsir or to give their opinion of the Quran when we already have the tafsir bil ma'thur? And if it is uh, possible and right to do it, how someone can do it and what, uh, what are the rules about that? So this is a tafsir bil ma'thur. Uh, just uh, before getting to a uh, tafsir of Ra'i, eh? what are the first main books of tafsir? So after Ibn Abbas, uh, ta'ala an, and this is, it was the first century. So Ibn Abbas, he has his companion uh, from the Tabi'een, and this companion, uh, uh, I'll, I'll can give you some of the name. Uh, 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 there's also Sahaba first, they are, uh, you know, versed in the tafsir. 
Uh, you find them in Medina, so the main center of the companion teaching the generation of the Tabi'een are in Medina, Al Kufa, Al Basra, Was Sham, and Medina to Al Kufa, Al Basra, Was Sham, and of course Mecca. And every one of them, he you know, he he established or like been uh, centered in one of these uh, center. However, Ibn Abbas was between Medina and mainly in Mecca, so he was the one that people who learned from him the most, as he was in a center place, and people go to Hajj, and one of the great, you know, report that they had, for example, Ibn Abbas giving them lectures in Arafah and things, and people, subhanAllah, learning and listening and writing. قال وتخرج عليه وقد تكون بين يدي ابن عباس في مكة. so many of the student they been formed by ابن عباس in مكة. and they have like today we say they have their degree so they have their their part of knowledge you know able and high credential able to to spread it. رجال من التابعين اختصوا برواية التفسير. So you have uh, some of the scholar who been, uh, uh, you know, expert in the tafsir, other in the hadith. So those experts in the tafsir, their first teacher uh, is Ibn Abbas radiallahu ta'ala. Uh, the scholars, they look at them, the scholar of the tafsir, they look at them in this high level. As the scholar of the hadith, they look at the high level of the of those muhaddithin from al-tabi'in. And these are men who have been, you know, trustworthy, known by their integrity, by their truthfulness, and by accuracy in the narration, which made, you know, scholars like al-Bukhari, rahimahullah ta'ala, to count on them and to report their saying in tafsir in his book, Sahih al-Bukhari. Some of this scholar, student of Ibn Abbas and expert in the tafsir, Al-Imam Mujahid, Ikrimah, Tawus, Ata ibn Rabah, Wa Sa'id ibn Jubayr. Wa Sa'id ibn Jubayr. If you go and read the book of tafsir, just examine some of the ayat, in Tafsir Ibn Kathir, Ibn Kathir, one of the great Tafsir who came after in the same root and uh, let's say institution or like a school of At Tabari. That's why when we talk about At Tabari is a school and he has after him many of the students and the best who um, from At Tabari like Al Qurtubi comes the Ibn Kathir. And you have another branch of tafsir like the Zamakhshari, even though he's a Mu'tazili. And the Zamakhshari, and you have Ibn Atiyah, uh, and so on in that same line. And you have one of the great scholar linguistic, if, uh, Abi Su'ud. And then there's, you know, from the contemporary ones well known, is Adwa al Bayan, Li uh, Shinqiti, Wa uh, Tahrir, Wa Tanweer. Ibn Ashur, which we're going to study the introduction related to a tafsir bil-ra'i from his, from his uh, uh, book of tafsir. And this is here that what you're seeing is all from his book that we'll be studying, insha'Allah ta'ala, uh, the ruling of the tafsir bil-ra'i. And then there's tafsir of Sayyid Qutb, uh, which is more oriented for the da'wah and was uh, one of the really amazing tafsir he has a style to present the whole surah. So it presents like by topic, the topic of the surah presented, you know, what the surah is talking about. So it ha he has, you know, a style, different folks on the da'wah. Uh, let's say da'wah, when you say da'wah, you know, on, on, uh, uh, on explaining the way of the emergence of establishing, of applying the system of Islam. And it has a great, you know, part of it, rahimahumullah uh, ta'ala ajma'in. Those are the main tafsir known. There's other, masha'Allah, like uh, tafsir uh, al-manar, uh, also uh, one of the great tafsir, but is not complete, is not complete, of, uh, uh, 
I'll mention his name, he's not in my mind now. Okay. The, after this first uh, generation came the second uh, uh, century. قال فلما استهل القرن الثاني ودخلت العلوم الإسلامية في دور التدوين. So we have the first generation, the first century in the time of the Prophet صلى الله عليه وسلم, and then the Tabi'een, and then starts سبحان الله the second century that when the Islamic knowledge get into the phase of تدوين, تدوين writing, you know. Uh, registering, writing, putting in notes, and making the books. So the second century. Uh, some of the a'imma from the scholar of hadith, his name Abdul Malik ibn Juraj. Abdul Malik ibn Juraj, he died uh, on uh, 149 Hijri. He collected all the hadith related to the book of Allah in tafsir. For example, all the hadith of the Prophet ﷺ that he mentioned about Surah Al-Baqarah and then Surah Ali Imran and so on. So this is the first compilation that it has reference to the tafsir. فَكَانَ أَوَّلُ مَنْ أَلَّفَ فِي التَّفْسِيرِ He was the first one to specify a book compiled that has tafsir, that has only the uh, hadith related to to the book of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Like Tafsir ibn Abi Hatim, you find they put the surah, the name of the surah, and all the hadith that being mentioned related to that surah. That's it. So this is the first book. Uh, he was one of the greatest scholars of the hadith, known by his integrity. Therefore, the hadith that he mentioned in this book, of first book of Tafsir, was Sahih. Was sahih. With this, دخل علم التفسير إلى حيز التدوين الكتاب. So with this first book, like the علم, the science of tafsir, start to have a book to refer to, and this is the scholar come to add to that. To add to that. The next one uh, that uh, in the half of the uh, second century of the Hijra. After the book of Abdul Malik ibn Juraish, there is someone uh, who uh, took that book and add to it the opinion of the companion, some of the tabi'in. So it's like referring to Ibn Abbas, referring to the student of Ibn Abbas, and he gone ayah by ayah, which is, subhanAllah, was the very first book which had this... Uh, a structure that we know it today. That we know it today. Uh, his name Yahya ibn Salam. Yahya ibn Salam. His name Yahya ibn Salam. I can uh, see his. Uh, Uh, his name Yahya ibn Salam al-Tamimi al-Basari al-Ifriqi al-Tamimi al-Basari so he's originally from Basra then he lived uh, the rest of his life in Ifriqiya and Ifriqiya which is the region of the North Africa including Tunisia, Algeria and that area of uh, Al-Maghrib al-Arabi and he was a teacher and scholar in Al Qayrawan, in Al Qayrawan, which is in Tunis, Tunisia today. And he died the year 200. The year 200. This is the first tafsir who had the same structure almost of the tafsir that we have today. Yaqulu ibn al Jazari, Yaqulu ibn al Jazari, about this book. قال أن هذا الكتاب سمع من مؤلفه بإفريقية. He studied this book of Tafsir ibn al Jazari. He traveled to إفريقية القيروان to hear it, you know, recite or read by the author يحيى ابن سلام himself. وشهد بأنه كتاب ليس لأحد 
uh, I mean, with the Senate. He heard it with the Senate. And he said that uh, this book, no one had liked it from the early books in the tafsir. وكذلك إمام القراءات أبو عمر الداني أبو عمر الداني he said ليس لأحد من المتقدمين مثل تفسير ابن سلام he said there's no one from the early scholars who had compiled the book of tafsir like ابن سلام like ابن سلام some part of this book exists in the old library in قيروان and تونس uh, but it's not, uh, you know, to know the structure and the, the way of the book. He was not known, you know, the many, the very famous book that is known in the whole Muslim world is Tafsiru At-Tabari, Tafsiru At-Tabari. However, Tafsiru At-Tabari, he was written in the third century. So we have kind of chain that is missed when we study and going back to the analysis of uh, Sheikh al Fadl, we'll find it that is in 200 is the book of Yahya ibn Salam. Yahya ibn Salam. I can go show you later, inshallah, after the break, uh, some of the book of the Tabari to see the structure, how he presents his book, how it, what we call it, Tafsirun Tahlili, ayah by ayah, by mentioning the, uh, the scholars first, and that's are this book our reference to establish the qaida, the base of our understanding of the ayah? Because you might be reading something and someone's mind goes like left and right and flies, you know, to the moon and come back and he thinks like everything is halal. You go back, when you go to these books, they put you on the path. So while you find yourself in that context on the path, you know, for example, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala said fadl. So what the fadl? Bounties. Bounties, I can explain it by, you know, the rizq I have. Right? It's a bounty from Allah. So when he said, no, Ibn Abbas, you know, according to what Mujahid report, he said, al-fadlu here is the Qur'an. Give you different perspective. So I put myself, look at the great fadl bounty of Allah in the Quran here. Then when I read it again, I will have more to explore this meaning in depth by that tip that I started with from where? From Al Ma'thur. I didn't define the bounty according to my knowledge today, according to what people they think is a bounty of God or grace from God. No, I defined it from from the student of the Prophet Sallallahu to teach it that Al-Fadl, the bounty of Allah, is the Qur'an. Then I let my understanding, my thinking, my reflection start from that point. That's how I guide my understanding by the Ma'thur. We'll, we'll look at an example, insha'Allah ta'ala. And then he'll continue to give a hadith, if there's a hadith, and give a general meaning, and so on. And then he next to the next ayah. And so on, that's what we call at tafsiru at tahlili, inshallah. Uh, yes. Huh? From the tabari. The tabari, but uh, that's why the, the tafsir, as we're going to see, the main tafsir, would they have distant branches? What do you mean this? And so every tafsir has kind of specification that give you more. For example, if you want to read the summary in general of a tabari, you take Ibn Kathir. It has almost the summary and some nice touch and comment Ibn Kathir because the tabari is bigger than the book of Ibn Kathir. The tabari is maybe 30 or like you put it in 15 big volume. Uh, Ibn Kathir, four volume. You see? Naam. And even uh, he didn't finish it to compile it in a way that he will get rid of the ahadith da'ifa, etc., etc. You find the tafsir of Abi Su'ud more versed to the linguistic part. And he will dig into the structure to give you more beautiful meaning. So he'll give you instead uh, like an imminent meaning of what you read connected with what it was narrated 
the same for as the Makhshari, for example, with being cautious, of course, of his ill aqidah of al i'tizal. Yeah. So we'll take the break and uh, see you after the salat, seven thirty, inshallah, ta'ala, with your break. Yes, 